good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Digital Health and Wearable Devices Workshop. Could everybody hear me and, and see me okay? Yes, you are. Like yes. Top half of you. Sure. Okay, great. All right. So this is uh, one of the afternoon parallel sessions of the 2021 CTSI Virtual Retreat, Navigating the Regulatory Pathway for Medical Devices Workshop. So I'm Yvonne Chan. I'm really delighted to be your moderator for this workshop. I, I hope you've had an opportunity to join the really fantastic morning sessions, uh, the keynote Q&A with Dr. Sharon, as well as the translational pathways discussion. I personally gained um, a deeper appreciation of the complexity, the, the rapid pace of change, <laughs> um, breadth of knowledge, resources, coordination required. To, to navigate and succeed uh, in the you know medical devices, digital yeah, health space. Both of these at the same time. Oh gosh, do you have so, headphones? So this uh, one. Do if I have no, no, I've got my headphones. Okay, so maybe I'll mute. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um. All right. So I, I muted everybody, uh, but the participants, you you could unmute yourself. Can you still hear me though? Just want to make sure before I move on. Okay, great. All right. So um, as I was saying, you know, it was a great morning session, um, very thrilling and, and daunting at the same time, I think is that combination that, that draws all of us uh, to, to doing this and, and per persevere. All right, but um, before we uh, start, I, I just wanna thank the CTSI organizers for bringing us all together for these really important discussions. All right, so in, in a moment, I will ask our esteemed panelists, the, the true stars of the show to introduce themselves. Uh, but first, just a very quickly an overview of the agenda for the one and a half hours uh, workshop that, you know, that we'll be spending together. We'll kick off with two brief presentations then we'll address some of the questions and comments submitted uh, pre-conference by workshop uh, registrants. Finally, um, Aaron, the organizer asked us to take the final 10 minutes to, to discuss next steps. So this is in a, another one-off, right? Um, how do we organize ourselves and, and just at least talk about some opportunities for ongoing engagement and, and collaboration. And uh, at the end of this workshop, which will end at 2.30 uh, Eastern, we'll take a five minute break. Then don't forget to join back uh, to the, the main uh, conference so that we have the uh, meeting wrap up with, with everybody and hear the report, uh, report outs from various panels uh, that were happening in parallel. All right. So I'll, I'll introduce myself to, to uh, get this going. Uh, as I said, I'm Yvonne Chan. I'm the medical director for digital medicine at Otsuka Pharmaceutical. My clinical training is in emergency medicine and I'm a digital health researcher. As a matter of fact, uh, prior to joining Otsuka only a year and a half ago, I was pretty much a lifetime <laughs> academic. Uh, I was at Mount Sinai Health System in New York City for about 11 years, uh, where I, I, I was the founding director for uh, Center uh, for Digital Health there. So now I look to each of our uh, four esteemed panelists to uh, introduce themselves. Um, just to make it easy, we'll go in alphabetical order. So if it's okay, uh, Bakul, would you mind going first, then Chi Wan, then Raquel, and then Subu. Absolutely. Thank you, Juan. And thank you all for having me today. I'm Bakul Patel. I'm the director for Digital Health Center of Excellence at USFDA and the Center for Devices. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, my name is Chi Huan Li, and I'm an assistant professor of biomedical and mechanical engineering at Purdue. My research uh, focused on the development of wearable biomedical devices. It's really good to see you all. Hi, 
I think I'm next. So this is uh, Captain Raquel Pete. I am the director of the Office of Orthopedic Devices uh, in the Office of Product Evaluation and Quality here at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health at FDA. And I look forward to this discussion. Hi, everybody. Uh, Subhu Venkatraman here. I'm the CTO of Echo Health. Uh, we build our cardiac monitoring products. Uh, prior to this, I was director of research at Fitbit, where I led the team, which built a lot of the algorithms and sensors that go into Fitbit's available products. Looking forward to the discussion. All right, fantastic. Well, without further ado, uh, Bakul, would you mind kicking off uh, the, the two presentations with yours first? Absolutely. Let me let me share my screen and then I have a few slides to share and then we'll try turn it back back to you on. OK. Let me know if you can see this. Yeah, thank you. you can. Great. So I want to kick off the discussion with um, with two two large topics. Firstly, what is digital health? How we are thinking about it from FDA perspective, and then I wanted to share some of the uh, authorizations we have we have seen and we have given for products that are going on. And then I want to end with a little bit of uh, excitement and seeing you know where things can sort of go. So I'll end with that. Hopefully this will be an exciting starting point for this conversation today, especially from, from this morning's discussion about how we can, um, how this community can actually be involved in this exciting place of digital health. So I think about digital health in this way. Um, it, is no, it is not about one product or one thing. It is a continuous and a convergence of connectivity, data and computing power for healthcare and across the life of an individual or patient. So, and I think one thing to just point out is like patients are in the center of this. We're really moving care and digital health technologies is enabling that uh, to move the care that a patient or individual gets from a clinic to the patients themselves. And you can also see um, that we're about in the verge of you know, understanding new physiology for, for individuals, us. And why, why is it important is this promise of we can get to a place where prevention and earlier smaller interventions are going to be powerful uh, to change the course of a disease or a condition. Having said that, you know, not everything in this space is you know, FTA's purview. Of course, there's general wellness products, there's healthy living products, and there's, there's things that happens in the care of, um, of a patient that may not necessarily be using technology but that's what digital technology healthcare is becoming. But within the scope of that, you can think about these five different domains that FDA has a view uh, and expectations. Like one very easy and un easy to understand is when it is used as a medical product. So when it is a medical product, digital health technology, we, we, we think there is expectations that we should meet. And they don't, they don't have to be treated in the same, same way across the spectrum, but they have the risk profile that FDA has a view on and we want to build that trust. The second is when it's built in to a medical product. So when I use the word medical product, I include pharma pharmacological products as well as medical devices, as biologics as well. And, and then third one is about in the making. So thinking about advanced manufacturing uh, and technology used in advanced manufacturing that can have effect on the safety and effectiveness profile of the product while it's been manufactured. So that's one thing that we need to think about as well. And we have some thoughts on that. As you can imagine, cybersecurity and, uh, uh, and those aspects, emerging issues are really important in those areas. Um, and then the last, and the, third, the fourth one is about clinical studies. You know, plenty of medical uh, uh, digital health technologies are being used today, variables and other things that we, we are trying to reduce cost and time in the clinical trials and the studies that are taken, taking place. And how does, that, how does that really shape? And we, FDA has lots of opinions on that and lots of expectations. So we can still back to this whole concept of build trust in the products that we regulate and there's available to patients in the US. And, but last not the least is the new place where things are emerging uh, is as, they, as digital health technologies that may not necessarily uh, you know, 
easily appear to seem to be a medical device or such, uh, they're becoming adjunct to a drug or a device or are becoming a companion diagnostics or a companion therapeutics. So we are looking, we are seeing these things sort of come up. And I'll share a couple couple examples of that down the road to give you a little bit of a flavor. Our goal always has been, and as Jeff said this morning, enhance patients' access to high quality digital health products. And I'll read, I won't read the entire thing, but it's really about we know the space is evolving so quickly. Products made in this area, in this, in the general area are iterating much, much faster, but we want to maintain the reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness as well, while being least burdensome to both agency and to makers of this product to really get to back to this and enhance patients' access to high quality products. We recently in, in September, 2020, 2020 uh, we launched the Center of Excellence and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the goal for this Center of Excellence is really to empower all stakeholders to foster responsible and high quality digital health innovation. And you know, it seems, seems really broad, but it's really about not having everything to do with regulations, but really bringing that ecosystem to a place where you know, even if it's not the regulated product, we are responsibly innovating. And that's sort of the intent behind this. And what can FDA do to lean forward? What, how can we connect and build partnerships? How can we share knowledge and then Last but not the least, and the very top is how do we innovate in our approaches? And Jeff talked about this morning and there was discussion earlier uh, in the general session, which talked about how can we really be on the forefront and how can FDA be on the forefront? So it becomes um, an important partner in this journey of getting products and uh, safe and high quality products to market to the patients. Today, um, I can tell you this is this is sort of the portfolio of things that we are looking at within the center of excellence. I mean, you guys might have heard um, software as a medical device, artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's technology used in any, any products, the variables that are either used as a medical device or not used and used in clinical trials, software in, in a medical device and so on and so forth. But some of the things that are sort of emerging and becoming really, really important is, and I would say interoperability, medical device uh, cybersecurity is becoming really important for us to start thinking about how do we allow for, for this connected world to really you know, take, the, take it to the highest potential at the same time being safe and being cautious about some of the vulnerabilities that it can exist with the connectivity. We've been working with IMDRF, which is the International Medical Device, uh, med uh, uh, medical device uh, Community Regulators, and we've been creating this framework for software as a medical device. We have published a, a four um, uh, articles and four, four guidances, which talk about, you know, what is what does the risk look like? What does the clinical evaluation look like? And then ultimately, what does how do we translate what we know as uh, quality systems, what we know as 1345, into into something that the software problems can sort of use? Having said that, we're starting to see very very novel and innovative products come to market. As you can imagine, some of this consumer technology, things that are used for gaming, things that are used for you know, keeping, keeping stress less, um, we're seeing those applications now moving into, into medical arena. And we anticipated that. And we anticipated it because we, we know in the space of software, things iterate and grow organically based on customer needs. And one thing leads to another. And we can see how consumers that are used to using technology in their day-to-day -day life are now is now becoming part of their, their, uh, their healthcare as well. And that's where most of the innovation is happening. Most of the low cost and uh, high touch and more engaging applications and solutions are sort of emerging. So I, want to, I wanted to make sure that we, we sort of are aware of that. We want to make sure that we have the right expectations when it actually when these products are used for for prevention, mitigation, diagnosing, or curing diseases. We we have the right expectations, so these technologies can actually be used. I want to share a little bit about some things that we are seeing already, and and Captain Raquel P just mentioned her group looks at some of these products. So I wanted to just give you a a view into the world of what we are starting to see in this space. Um, you're seeing a lot of 
electronics, a lot of uh, uh, augmenting and assistive products being uh, being coming to the marketplace and very innovative. If you look at the X Vision spine system, it's it's actually that headset that I was showing earlier with the cat picture in there that shows virtual reality of how do how do clinicians can start start becoming much more intimate and much more immersive in the process that you're using. And then so, uh, augmenting uh, implants with, with precise measurements can actually also help us get better at how we, how we implement some of these implants. But on the, on the therapeutic end, we are also seeing a, a plenty of innovation happening and we are, we are starting to see this uptick into how novel technologies are actually also bringing therapeutic uh, solutions to the marketplace. And you can see from the dates, they're, they're all happened in the last couple of years and things are sort of ticking, up ticking from there on. And I'm sure uh, Captain Raquel would probably share a, a bit more about the, this, this sort of upcoming trends. But I wanna end with this, um, uh, with, this, with this example areas where you can see where the future of bio, composite biomarkers are going. Um, I don't know how many of you guys in the audience have uh, have looked at energy harvesting technology, and it doesn't take much more uh, imagination to see what energy harvesting sort of can do. And then on the right hand side, you're seeing how it can be connected to some of the sensors, um, and that can give you a holistic view of an individual's physiology. So I'm going to leave this for a, for a minute for you guys to start uh, reflecting on how should we think about moving forward. So we are seeing this, we are seeing this trend going forward. How do we kind of take this and be prepared for this digital revolution that's happening in front of us? But let me just shift gears a little bit and say, what are we gonna do about this? So we know a few things. We know the product development timelines in the space is short. Um, it used to be many years, it should be years. And we are seeing when software based products can be in weeks and sometimes days you're all used to seeing updates, which means that it's iterative and it's incremental. We also know that our post-market view of this world is very minimal today. But in the space, we also know that, you know, there's an, because of the connectivity, because of the digitization, there's a high availability of rich real world data that includes benefits and risk that's available to us. But the real problem on our hand is also, we see, about 3,500 to 4,000 submissions a year um, and about 2,200 to 3,000 pre-submissions a year. We, we know the volume of this, this market is going to be exponentially increasing over time, especially when things that don't appear to be medical devices slowly iterate themselves or incrementally raise themselves to a place that they will actually become medical devices. At that point in time, there's going to be some oversight based on our current laws that we need to look at. But we really need to think about, you know, in our current paradigm, which is really not fit for purpose, like Jeff's talk this morning, we need to think about how do we move forward. So we have been imagining to see how can we move from this conceptually episodic way of looking of product market authorization to a more holistic, ongoing, and continuous oversight that reduces the friction and enables trust on an ongoing basis that depends upon not just the product itself, but also the product, who's making the product and how the product is performing in the marketplace. So we've been thinking about this and we've been on this journey for almost two years now, two and a half years, and we are working towards that. And, but it comes down to these five principles. We wanna make sure patient safety is top, um, top most on our list and followed by cleaning of uh, quality product quality, clinical responsibility, cybersecurity responsibility, and proactive culture. Now, these five principles are not foreign to FDA or not, not to people who have been living in the space. I can tell you that these are all embedded and they all cross connect to all the requirements that we have in place today. This is a total product lifecycle approach where we are, we're no longer looking at you know, one spot in time and sampling at that point but also looking at an ongoing basis. So this is just a depiction of what I was just sharing, sharing earlier. We took that same concept and said, the world of AI ML is also evolving. And we put out a working model, a discussion paper, which proposed, if you were to make AI ML as a use case of the fastest 
iterating or the most frequently iterating uh, software product, software as a medical device, how do we sort of make that happen? So we put this with this model out, we got a whole, whole lot of comments, actually very in informative comments. And we suggest uh, we are, we recently just published a plan of how to move forward. And again, you're seeing a thematic um, uh, implementation of how we are approaching this pro the, the space of digital health. We are, one thing is we're no longer, we're no longer just thinking about an episodic way. We're looking at across the life cycle, what else is, in, what else is in, available for us to get the assurance of safety and effectiveness. And we are, we are, going, we are of course going to publish a guidance. We are, we are looking at how, what other um, areas of clarity we can provide from, from a good machine learning practices, which is akin to sort of what we all know in 62304 or other, other quality system standards. We also know there's increasing um, uh, discussions around ethics around AI ML. We also know there's increasing discussion around diversity of data these machines are being trained on and looking at how do we sort of really collect real world performance that can inform a regulatory decision making is really what we're looking for. So at the end, we're looking at how do we sort of take that those approaches and truly become a continuous assurance of organizational and product performance. That's our vision. We're trying to get there. I'm also going to share with you a little bit of where we are in the journey. We, like any other product development, we've been working on the program development in the exact same way. We started off in 2017 with an idea, with a concept, we built it to a concept, we researched some more, and now we are building and slowly iterating towards how we can really get to beta testing and try out this program. With that, I'm going to stop right here and 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 turn it back to Yvonne to, uh, for the next discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pakal. That that was uh, incredibly timely uh, and important uh, discussion and presentation, which touches um, on a lot of the questions that were submitted by the registrants uh, pre-conference. So thank you so much. Um, with that, uh, Sabu. Would you, are you ready to be? Okay, <laughs> take it away, please. Our second presenter, thank you. Hey, can you folks see these slides? Yeah, I see and hear you well, thank you. Yep, excellent. Uh, hey, people, a uh, pleasure to speak, speak, speak to you today. I spent many years in digital technologies for health and wellness. Uh, so we thought it would be good uh, to provide, just go over some of my experiences in the space to show what it takes to actually uh, bring these digital health technologies to a product and to the market. So um, I spent about six years at Fitbit, uh, right from the time when we were building hip worn accelerometers to count steps to when we were building heart rate and calorie measurements on the wrist to meditation apps on the wrist to VO2 max to atrial fibrillation, which is a medical application. So you clearly see this transition going from building wellness products to building medical products. And we see this in wearables pretty strongly. Um, and one of the questions we often get asked is what where does that threshold lie, right? And the way I think about it um, is that it depends on the claims that we make, right? So if we claim that we're trying to measure heart rate for exercise, that's a wellness product. If you claim that you're trying to measure heart rate to identify a patient who has bradycardia to send them to a doctor, that's a medical product. If you look at sleep to figure out how long a person's sleeping, that's a wellness product. But if you look at sleep to understand if a person has sleep apnea, that's a medical product. So that's how we think about that threshold of when a wellness product transitions to being a medical product. And you see a lot of uh, wearable players right now getting to the world of building atrial fibrillation detection. And so let's talk for a second about atrial fibrillation. It's pretty simple, actually. It, it, it looks, it's when you have an irregular rhythm of the heart, and this can be detected by looking at the um, pattern and the shape of the ECG. And it turns out that wrist worn wearables are particularly suited to detecting atrial fibrillation. They have two sensors on board. They have something called a PPG, which is a photoflexmogram, which can detect the blood flow in the wrist. 
They also often nowadays have ECGs, which can detect the electrical signal across the two hands and therefore the electrical signal across the heart. And those two signals are very good, uh, are very good inputs for an atrial fibrillation algorithm. And which is why you're seeing this uh, in the last couple of years, a lot of products in the market from Apple, from Samsung, from Fitbit and others, um, which detect atrial fibrillation. And we think that's absolutely awesome. I got to play a role in this in this world as well. And it's really nice to see these wearable products, which were wellness devices, kind of transition into the world of being actual medical applications. But when you think about cardiac applications, atrial fibrillation is just one of the things we should be concerned about. There are obviously many other cardiac conditions that we would like to track, like, like to screen for, like to monitor. For example, val valvular heart disease, where you have a disease of one or more valves, heart failure, which is very prevalent in fact. And it would really be nice if we could build better um, screening technologies and monitoring technologies for these patients and for these and for these uh, and for these conditions, and that's what we set out to do at my new role at Echo. And the way we did that is by using one of the most common cardiac screening tools, which is in the market right now, which is a stethoscope. And a stethoscope is a very interesting device. It was invented about two hundred years ago by Dr. Rene Lenac effectively just a, a mechanical wooden tube which amplifies heart sounds and lung sounds right and over the last 200 years it has not evolved too much surprisingly so it's yeah you we don't use a wooden tube anymore we use a flexible rubber tube the diaphragm is better at am amplifying sounds but other than that oh yeah and you can now have it in pink but other than that the technology has not progressed tremendously so what we did is we, we, we decided to build the next generation of uh, stethoscopes where we take the sound coming from the chest piece and we amplify it, filter it, digitize it, and send it to the clinician's ear so that it sounds a lot better. We can add ECG as well, which you're seeing on the right. So you can now have both heart sounds and ECG. And more importantly, we can also send this data in real time over Bluetooth to the phone, to your iOS or your Android phone. So the, Clinician can now do things like share the data uh, with another clinician, get a second opinion, save the data, can ask questions like, how does your heart sound compared to when I saw you last a year ago, which they have absolutely no way of answering right now. Right, So we turn this very simple 15 second stethoscope exam, which is conducted on most patients, into a really powerful AI enabled screening tool. And I didn't mention the AI part yet. And the AI part is that once we have this data, we can send that up to our cloud, and if a clinician can listen to heart sounds or look at ECG and interpret them, we can write algorithms to do the same. And that's what I'd like to speak to you about for the rest of this talk. Oh, the one thing which I didn't, didn't mention is that we've sold a large number of these telescopes now in the field, and they are being used all over the world. And it, it is really phenomenal to see these devices being used especially in the crazy world that we live in right now, where the ability to have a stethoscope, which is um, decoupled from the earpiece. So you can have ear pods in your ear while you're inside PPE, have a stethoscope in the patient's chest and be completely safe while listening to the patient's heart or listening to the patient's lungs. And that is remarkably powerful in the world of, uh, world of uh, COVID. And this, we've seen huge uptake in this application as well. So let's talk about AI now for a little bit. And the way I think about it, when I think about AI in medical applications, I think that it should fit seamlessly into clinical workflow and provide a second opinion on sensor data. That's how the first steps will be of really seeing AI work in the clinical domain. And we're seeing this come about in many different domains like radiology, ophthalmology, I'll speak more about cardiology because that's my space. So what we do, for example, is we know that when a clinician listens to heart sounds, they can listen to the lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub of your heart and recognize when there are extraneous sounds present there. And those extraneous sounds are an indication of disease states. 
So what we did now is we built up a large retrospective corpus of hot, hot sounds, annotated them by experts, and then built an algorithm to go detect all the irregular hot sounds and separate and distinguish them from normal hot sounds. Of course, building that algorithm is just one small piece of the puzzle, right? So we worked a lot on taking that algorithm, validating it in actual clinical studies, working very closely with the FDA on figuring out what it would take to get clearance of this algorithm, what evidence they wanted to see, worked on writing up our Python K and so on, got the clearance, and then deployed it on our apps and our web infrastructure. So as you can see, there's a long pathway from building the algorithm, which is the very first step, to actually having it cleared and having it in the market. And we now have a number of algorithms cleared. We can detect murmurs in hot sounds, like I spoke about a little bit earlier. We can detect atrial fibrillation, which we spoke about earlier from the ECG. We can look at uh, heart rate and say whether someone has bradycardia, tachycardia. We can look at QRS intervals. So many different aspects of interpreting hot sounds and ECG. And we have a whole roadmap ahead of other algorithms that we intend to build. And the part that gets me excited, honestly, is how do you make this completely seamless, right? So one of the things we do is we enable a video visit. And many of you may have seen, seen your doctor in the last year and probably was a Zoom call like this one. And that's fine if you are reasonably healthy. But if you have an underlying cardiac condition, Zoom really doesn't cut it for a video visit. The doctor wants to listen to your heart. The doctor wants to see ECG. So we allow the technology, we, we built the technology where you can conduct a video call and simultaneously have your clinician um, look at your ECG because you have your, you have your uh, stethoscope on, on, on your chest and listen to your heart sounds. And while they're doing that, they can also simply press a button here and this will automatically record 15 seconds of data and run the AI and show them a AI result. So that's completely seamless, right? So it does not change the workflow in any way. And the patient actually may not even be aware that AI is part of the, of the loop and the clinician gets a second opinion from the AI. We think that that's a model which really works very well. And we are looking forward to expanding on that. Looking a little forward, when we think about where this is going to lead, we think that the next generation of these kind of algorithms would will start recognizing features which are invisible to the best trained human eye. And this again is true across many of these fields. It's true in radiology as well. And as an example of this, one of the things that we're working on is something called low ejection fraction detection, where uh, ejection fraction is typically measured using an echocardiogram. It's uh, an ultrasound of your heart, and you measure the fraction of blood that is pumped out with the left ventricle with every beat. And it, you, you, you would want to screen for patients who have a low ejection fraction. Unfortunately, you would need to take an echocardiogram to do so, and that's expensive, and it's not something that you do for every patient. But what if you could figure this out by just looking at the ECG? Now you could ask a cardiologist this and they will tell you that no, it's not really possible to just look at an ECG and tell you which patient has a low EF or, or not. But it turns out that if we had access to a very large corpus of data of echocardiograms paired with ECGs taken very close to each other in time, we worked closely with the Mayo Clinic on this, and we built an al algorithm which can now look at a single lead ECG and predict which are the patients who have a low ejection fraction. That's phenomenally powerful now because that becomes a really nice screening tool to identify those patients and then send them for a follow-up test. Right. So we, we, one of the things that was mentioned earlier in the day was this breakthrough designation. So we got breakthrough designation on this uh, SAMD from the FDA. So we've been working really closely with them and interacting closely with them on uh, taking on bringing bringing this technology uh, to the market. Um, I'll end with one last thing, which is, again, related to something that Bakul mentioned in the previous talk, which is we're super excited about this direction of uh, regulation for AIML, right, where this idea that manufacturers have the option to submit a pre a pre uh, change control plan, and that allows us to work with the FDA on how this algorithm will evolve over time. 
we think it's a very good idea to have regulations over algorithms. We don't think it should be the Wild West, right? So we think there should be regulations, but we'd love to work with the FDA on figuring out, okay, now that we have this original algorithm cleared, how can it evolve over time? And what are the guardrails to put in place so that we can ensure that it re remains a safe and effective algorithm? So we're, we're really excited about this direction. It's exactly the way that I think about AI ML as well. Um, I'll end with one last slide, which is, these are the kind of reviews that we get from clinicians, right? And at the end of the day, we do all this work, we build all this technology, we um, go, go through the regulatory process and what's it for? And sometimes it's important to remember that. And we are in the lucky position that since we've sold so many devices, we get feedback directly from the field telling us the impact that we have on clinicians' lives and on patients' lives. And at the end of the day, this is what gets me excited. This is what gets me to build uh, the products that we build. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabu. Um, we, we didn't uh, coordinate prior to this, uh, but my, my husband, who's a, a pulmonologist and intensivist, uses uh, your device. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yes, uh, it, it, it's, you know, um, anyway, and, you know, digital health has touched uh, so many of our specialties. Um, because he's also a sleep uh, specialist. You could just imagine some of his patients, um, they, they are now challenging in a good way, you know, some of the practicing clinicians now because they, are, they have access to certain devices. And uh, so for, for the uh, practitioners out there who have not uh, fully really uh, embraced uh, and adopted some of these technologies, uh, sometimes it's the consumers who, who's driving that. Um, and uh, so now there's uh, more of a, a sense that, you know, they, they need to pay attention <laughs> and, and get on board to a certain degree, right? I, because this is where the, the space is going. But thank you so much uh, for your presentation as well. Uh, really insightful. And it touches on uh, some of the other uh, the questions that have come in. And uh, one of them is uh, around uh, implementation as well. Um, and that's something that's uh, top of mind for me. Some, sometimes when we, uh, you know, design or create or deploy a, whether it's a device or uh, some technology, you know, it doesn't really exist in isolation for it to be uh, really uh, deployed, utilized in the clinical realm. There, there's just so much more uh, involved uh, to the, all the wraparound services and uh, needs, features for it to be actually successful. All right, all right, great, thank you. Excellent um, presentations uh, by our panelists. So if it's okay, um, I think we'll we'll go ahead now and switch gears and uh, to address some of the questions and comments submitted pre-conference by some of the, the workshop uh, participants. And since we have not heard from two of our uh, panelists, I, I thought maybe we'll start with a more of a high level type uh, set of questions that came from our participants around you know the vision uh industry trends uh digital health vision uh where where do you see the future direction of uh, technology and healthcare? um there were comments uh, and questions around telehealth so uh would uh, either of our um participants i mean panelists like to take that raquel or chi Huan? I'll go ahead and start. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. You know, one of the things that we were talking to Jeff the other day, so all of the different office directors had to sit with Jeff about a week or two ago to do a forecasting meeting of all the different technologies that we think are coming on the horizon to discuss what are the scientific challenges as well as the regulatory challenges. Within our office, the Office of Orthopedic Devices, we are seeing more um, augmented reality, virtual reality devices, as well as our regulatory devices, um, even to the point that we're seeing more of our smart devices that are coming in with the sensoring and measuring that is um, needed. You know, one of the things that we feel, we are excited about the technology, but we do have 
question centered around the regulatory science. So going back to the discussion earlier this morning, I think um, not just Jeff, but also um, Rob really brought up a good point about great idea without regulatory path. I think that's where, you know, as FDA, we want to make sure that when it comes to innovation, that we're having that discussion very early in the process as opposed to late in the process. And hence the reason that um, we brought up more than once about the breakthrough device program, because that program really gears towards our innovators. It's a free program but it gives a dedicated team of FDA staff that are multidisciplinary in their approach to be able to provide the advice uh, to either small stakeholders or large, right? So smaller or, or large companies so that it can be more of a partnership. So when it does come in from a regulatory standpoint, we would have addressed any scientific challenges or regulatory challenges as we move forward. Um, for us, um, you know, not just having the breakthrough designation program, which has expanded within our particular office with the number of requests that are coming in, but to address the communication from our community, we have also um, had a program called the Safer Technologies Program. So for those devices that don't necessarily meet the criteria within the breakthrough uh, devices programs, such as life-threatening, life-debilitating, but yet these are serious conditions. We do have the Safer Technologies Program that was launched in December of last year. And it's a similar program where for both the breakthrough devices as well as the Safer Technologies Program have a dedicated team of FDA staff working together. There's an also an opportunity for frequent meetings with rapid turnaround with our responses. So that's about 45 days, if not less, uh, to be able to address the concerns um, that are being raised. Now, I saw a number of the questions that were being posed. For us, I can say some of the regulatory challenges that we're having, we know once we approve or clear any of these particular products, we're already behind as far as the technology is concerned. And we know that there's gonna be additional technology that's come in afoot. So we are very much um, discussing as a group, how do we um, reduce the regulatory burden without reducing the science uh, that is needed or to show safe and effectiveness, but being agile in our framework to be able to put these products on the market for our patients. And so within my group, I know that I, you all talk about think tanks from a larger group, but we also have our think tanks here in the agency that we are partnering with different individuals, not just within my office, but experts um, in other offices, such as the Office of Science um, and Engineer Laboratories. And we are really coming up with best practices as to how we should review these products, making sure that we're consistent in our approach, not just with how we are reviewing these products, but equally um, in our feedback to the applicant that comes in. So um, I say bottom line, you know, all the things that uh, Bakul has indicated is where we're adopting within the review um, offices, but equally we're thinking about different ways that we can move forward on bringing these products faster to market. Thank you so much, Raquel. Uh, Ji Wang, do you have any thoughts about future directions? Uh, what's your perspective on uh, where this field is headed? Any challenges? You may be on mute. Okay, uh, I, I have a follow-up question for Raquel and uh, Bakul. Uh, this is one of the uh, questions that, that, were, that was submitted prior to the conference. It's around, uh, if I remember the context, it was uh, perhaps a, um, a researcher more in the academic realm. Uh, you know, well, actually, I myself started off in academia, making the bridge over to industry. But wherever you are in the process, it, I'm talking about 
uh, subset of the stakeholders who may not be in a large organization, you know, uh, with say a regulatory team that that's well <laughs> resourced and experienced to, to really take on this role, right? So this uh, initial uh, reaching out to the FDA, even just to establish contact and some initial guidance um, and to initiate the conversation is it, quite daunting. I'll just be honest. Uh, I could just imagine, right? I mean, I, I, I have the luxury of being part of a team or if I choose to hide behind my regulatory colleagues to, to, to be the uh, interface. Um, any suggestions, uh, recommendations for um, you know, I, I would imagine a lot of the stakeholders uh, fall in the, the other category. So there are just, you know, think about the tremendous barriers uh, involved already, right? Um, so how, how any, any words of wisdom, uh, reassurance, or just, uh, you know, best practice <laughs> on, on how, to, how to start that? Because as you said, earlier is better than later. Otherwise, you may uh, go down some rabbit hole. But at the same time, you know, people are making calculated, uh, you know, risk judgment. Am I breaking to jail <laughs> by too, being too transparent, for instance? Okay, I'll be quiet and, and let our regulatory colleagues uh, share uh, your thoughts around this. I'll let Bakul go and then I'll go <laughs> follow up. <laughs> Thanks, Raquel. Um, you know, that's a great question, and we actually face that every day. A day-to-day -day occurrence in my group is exactly interfacing with those people who don't have the, the luxury to hide behind the regulatory team, um, but have an initial idea. And so uh, if, you, if you didn't catch my last line, it's actually digitalhealth at fda.hhs.gov. You could literally ask an idea question to us. And we will quickly, my team quickly goes through our existing guidances and saves Ra Raquel from, uh, from answering those questions, but really re reserved Raquel and her team's time for this queue submissions, where we really think they were ready to have a queue submission. So we, we are providing the service, we have been starting, we provided the service, service since 2013, and we've been continuing to do that. So I would encourage people to start uh, looking at that. Uh, really, we get questions as if, you know, I have this idea, what do I need to do? What do I need to look? And sometimes it's just as simple as pointing them to a guidance. Um, but 90% of our questions are, I think we, we may be touching FDA's regulatory jurisdiction. Should I or should I not? And I would say you, it's, I don't have the right percentage in front of me, but we get, we respond back with, wait a minute, we already said we are not looking at this. Oh, wait, wait a minute, we've seen this kind of products already exist and we regulate those. And these are some thing references for you. When you're ready to have a robust conversation around you know, studies or anything else next, you can talk to OHTX in, in, our, in our office of product evaluation and they, we will we'll direct them door, over there. And sometimes as part of, uh, of Madufa, uh, we have committed to, uh, to bringing that cross center like cross OHT view, which is what my group does as well, to both serve internal customers like Raquel's team might, might ask us like, okay, what have you seen in this area in other areas? Can we, can we get a jump start on that? So we're not, the OHTs and the reviewers are not discovering from scratch every time around. So we do those both internal service and external service to people. So I think we should start there is what my recommendation would be. Fantastic, thank you. Well, I would say from my perspective, although I've been wearing this uniform for over two decades, we're still human at FDA. And um, we're more importantly, we're scientists and we're here for public health. Uh, the reason why I have taken it upon myself uh, for a number of the office directors within the review offices are to speak to the audience, you all in these smaller venues as well as larger venues so that we can dispel the myth that FDA is not here to assist in moving forward. I know it is um, typically considered a daunting process, uh, but one of the things that I do emphasize um, both internally as well as externally is to um, ensure that we're communicating effectively 
um, what is our recommendation in moving forward. It is not something that we're saying this is compulsory for you to do um, while you're going through your development phase, but we're giving you the best advice based on the information that you've um, put forward. Uh, additionally, it is not just isolated to the members of the Office of Orthopedic Devices. We are collaborating um, across the space. We do contact the COOLS team. We contact other areas of expertise in our, in our uh, center, as well as we talk to each other to see whether or not you've seen something like this and how is it, how did you address this particular challenge so that we can move it forward. So speaking about the area of customer service, that's been a champion of the center for a number of years to make sure that we're um, really being professional in our communicating and being very consistent in our approach. Even for myself, um, noting that I have a slew of meetings and so forth, I try my best to respond back to emails within 48 hours. And if it's past the 48 hours, I'm apologizing for the delay. And that's the type of communication that we're trying to foster so that we can bring more innovative products to the market. And it does not happen when we are sitting be behind the coffers of FDA. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, gosh, there there were quite a number of uh, <laughs> regulatory questions. It, it's hard to uh, choose uh, which ones to. I, I'm doing my best uh, to. I, I suppose, um, although it was already uh, covered in in the two presentations. But this is sort of fundamentally, I think, what a lot of people are, are uh, trying to figure out. Sometimes um, the, the bounds of what's being regulated within digital health, right? Um, it may be uh, black and white, but frequently sometimes, and, you know, and this could come in different forms. I, well, you know, what's top of mind for me would be in the context of a combination product, for instance, but this is, but we could up level it. It's just uh, there, you know, we, we have questions about just trying to figure out uh, what components of, uh, say, a product uh, falls under enforcement discretion. Um, so I, I don't know if that's something um, you you care to uh, elaborate a little bit more about, um, and I suppose the the question is since this space is rapidly uh, evolving and the agency has been so uh, really responsive, uh, trying to address um, the the whole fit for purpose, keeping up with uh, you know the new development and um, Bakul uh, use the. Uh, example of MLAI. So um, over time, certain things will change, right? Um, I, I, I don't know if uh, you, you'd like to comment uh, about the, this evolution of uh, how, how regulatory enforcement um, may, may uh, change over time depending on uh, the needs. And, and lastly, since I did mention uh, combination products, that's when it does get a little bit tricky. Well, you know, what portions um, are, are truly, uh, uh, you know, uh, heavily regulated versus, um, you know, could fall under uh, enforcement discretion. And uh, do you see uh, moving forward the Center for Digital Health uh, perhaps taking on a, a more central role to, to enable uh, some of these uh, reviews and filings. Okay, that was loaded. <laughs> I, I will mute myself. I will, I will give you a little bit of perspective. So yes, the short answer is we as FDA are trying to harmonize within our, within our approaches towards these technologies. So um, not to say that what is, ex what is um, effectively the risk profile when a product used or digital health technology used on its own uh, is, the, is going to be the same risk profile when it's compared to use with some other therapeutic, like a drug or some biologics. And they have a very different profile. And the rationale for that is there are different laws. And because of the, of the 
uh, of the composition of the product itself might actually have different effects and the impact of technology might have a different effect on, uh, on the medical product. So that's sort of, I wanna make sure that we are grounded in that first. And having said that, I think there is definitely the, this desire to start looking at how do we get to the same place while managing all those risks. So as part of the center of excellence, we will be looking at as next steps to how do we get closer and be consistent in application of our, uh, and, and if you're not, if we don't have to be consistent in the same way, we at least explain why it is. So, and that's sort of the goal we're driving towards. So like we want to make sure people understand it's not because, um, just because the laws are different, it's because there's risk profiles that we need to manage and need to make sure that they are mitigated to the reasonable level. And that's sort of how I see it. Um, I can tell you my colleagues in other centers and even in the combination products office uh, have been really, really open about how do we work together? How do you make sure some of these technologies can actually be used in the most efficient way? Um, at the same time, we are also, and I will be honest and say, I think we are also learning along the way because it's an emerging area. And because of that, I think it's gonna be some transition and we're not gonna be perfect. We are humans, like Raquel said, and we are going to be learning. And I think we all need to work together and be ex extremely clear about what is it that you're trying to achieve and what is the agency trying to achieve? And once we get there, I think we will get to a common place. Wonderful. Uh, any other panelists would like to weigh in before we move on to another topic? Okay, so switching gears a little bit, um, this is on the, the broader category of uh, using sensors, devices, and trials, and the validation of digital endpoints. Um, and I'll, I'll just read uh, quickly a, a couple uh, comments or questions, just general guidance on validating digital endpoints collected by uh, wearables. Uh, sensors, remote monitoring, and um, let's see, uh, products uh, evolved during a trial, especially with software, any guidance on how to address this when uh, encountered uh, during a, a filing trial? I think what that question is about is in, in digital health, as we know, uh, especially software, <laughs> where the life cycle is uh, fast, and we, you know, a lot of us in the space have, have encountered it. Uh, you know, with say, uh, say a mobile app, uh, even within a, a study, depending on the duration and, and the scope of the work, right? Uh, even bug fixes. Oh my gosh! You know, you start cataloging the, the number of uh, different versions of, of the app. So I suppose in uh, in a non regulated, non filing trial uh, circumstance, um, you know, it's just documentation. And I find that the peer review process, uh, you know, most people understand that it hasn't really been a, a huge problem. Um, I, I maybe the question from this uh, registrant is if it's uh, more of a uh, say a. a uh, a filing trial um, where, you know, obviously there are uh, certain um, higher standards around that, just uh, if you have any comments. So I'll um, end with any comments around uh, <laughs> digital endpoints, validation of such, uh, guidance, thoughts, recommendations for the group. I will just say that I think what you just pointed out is exactly what we are also trying to solve. Um, and I don't know if the answer is so straightforward. In fact, I just want to just point out that the, the definition of digital health technology was just added to the best framework um, that for biomarkers framework as well, uh, just recently. Um, so I think that's progress in that right direction. I think you will also start to see because of the center of excellence, we will start to have these conversations around what is it? What is acceptable as documentation? Because I, I think there's two parts of the equation. One is um, the reviewers at FDA, uh, either at CDR or CDRH or CBER, they all want to know if the endpoint was met in a way that's, that can be you know, relied upon. Um, now, there is going to be an area around, and around in, especially in software, 
where things iterate. And then I think those iterations should should really, I mean, one could think they should not affect the quality of the endpoint or at least the deterministic nature of the endpoint. Now that evaluation process needs to be in place. And then what do you explain to somebody who is not part of the actual trial so they can understand that nothing has changed? So I think that's the conversation we need to have. I think we are where we are today is we are, we are very used to, we know some, some tool we are using a trial and we fix it and we don't change it until the trial is done. Um, and those tools are no longer um, scalable in this today's world, especially in the remote world, right? We can't really scale that. Now, there's many technical ways of solving it, but I think that's not the point. I think the point is, can the trial PI or the trial sponsor, can, can they get their arms around the changes and what are they, how are they managing those changes so that they really know what affects the endpoints uh, uh, pristineness, so to speak. Great. You know, I was thinking about your question, Yvonne, and I think it would be equally good if we can hear from Subu, because I, I think you can give some real life example regarding ECHO and some of the challenges that you had in bringing this technology forward. Absolutely. Um, I agree with what Buckle mentioned, that the instinctive reaction is to try not to change anything. Uh, because that's the easy that's the easy way to solve it, right? Uh, but that's not always possible. And uh, what we think about it again from the classic risk-based approach, right? We we would be very hesitant to change anything regarding the raw sensor data. We would be very hesitant to change anything regarding the um, user interface, which might change the possibility of getting good data versus noisy data or some such, right? So th there are certain aspects of the product which we can consider to be critical and we are very hesitant to change those. And if there are changes to other aspects um, which we believe do not affect the endpoints, then we are willing to make those changes but document them well and be uh, able to explain why we believe that those changes do not affect the endpoints. So. Uh, I think it comes down to a risk-based approach and it comes down to having a good understanding of um, what aspects of your product are likely to affect your endpoints. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, thank you and great idea, Raquel. It's always good to get the um, real world <laughs> uh, experience and, and, and feedback on that. Uh, Wonderful. I, I, I thought maybe I'll just briefly mention uh, for, for those uh, participants who may be interested there um, in 19, 19, oh my gosh, 2019, uh, there, there's an organization, a nonprofit called Digital Medicine Society, the Dime Society. It's uh, the first professional organization uh, for, for experts, um, well, uh, I would imagine most of the, the participants of, of uh, this conference uh, comprised of, uh, you know, uh, folks and, uh, in, in, you know, healthcare technology um, and, and the, the idea is, you know, coming together so we, we could solve for some of the, the bigger challenges. Why, why am I mentioning Dime Society out of the blue? It's because I was reminded of uh, the fact that they have published um, a digital clinical measures playbook uh, for those that uh, may be interested in, in this particular topic. I do urge you to um, take a look. Um, they uh, were able to, uh, I believe, uh, collate around 34 uh, digital endpoints to date, and, and they've uh, launched it only a little over a year ago. So um, uh, pretty uh, impressive um, you know, progress there uh, for, for those that are really interested in, in that topic. All right, um, let's see another. Can I also add as well, um, for those that are interested in this particular technology, particularly for the orthopedic space, in 2018, we had a workshop, a public workshop where we discuss smart devices. And 
subsequent to that meeting in 2018, and you can find this just by doing a Google because the information is all posted. Subsequent to that, we went ahead and um, published a manuscript that really summarizes our understanding of that particular meeting and where we want to go. Um, by next month, March, which is Monday, uh, we will be issuing a survey to those uh, participants that um, attended that meeting in 2018, as well as some other stakeholders as well, just to get the feedback um, from everyone in our ecosystem as to what are still the remaining concerns that we should be thinking about. In the 2018 workshop, we spoke specifically about um, utility of the technology, um, also uh, clinical impact. We talked about adoption and practice of medicine. We also talk about the reg regulatory strategies that we were thinking about that could be adopted, as well as you know other areas as um, cybersecurity and managing the data that's being transmitted using smart devices. And so. Um, I don't, I am not a strong believer in everything coming directly from FDA and that's it. Um, this is where we're having another, we're doing the survey to obtain what are the viewpoints since the two years of having that public workshop because it is our thought process that we need to really re-engage re this particular discussion in 2022 just so that we can uh, make sure that we're staying abreast of the science, not really tagging behind, but um, this is a conversation that we're having internally as well as to what is the regulatory strategy to be able to address these submissions that we're seeing more of and uh, try our best to be least burdensome in our approach and understanding of the benefit and risk profile um, as it stands right now. So you know, we are equally struggling as well, and we are learning in this emerging field, but I do think uh, by having these outward conversations and seeking input, it could also help with the communication that is coming from uh, FDA as the regulatory body in this, in, in this country. Fantastic. Um, thank you for that, Raquel. All right, um, I think we have time for maybe one or two uh, final topics. I, I found this to be uh, interesting and important. It's the concept of uh, physician or healthcare practitioners voice and input in the AI revolution. Uh, so this uh, registrant wrote, um, so he or she really commend the FDA on last month's release of the action plan for AI ML uh, software as medical device. One of the challenges in medical AI is it brings together a wide variety of stakeholders who traditionally do not work together. While there are some physicians who have largely hung up their white coat for industry endeavors, they are in the minority. Do you have suggestions on how regular frontline physicians and physician scientists can have our voices heard in this AI revolution away from all the politics of trade organizations and industry special interests. At the end of the day, we're going to be in the ED, on the wards, in the ORs, and clinics uh, implementing AI, medical AI. Having a plan for this at the beginning and doing comprehensive engagement for physicians, I'm going to throw in their HCPs, uh, might prevent some of the problems with the last great medical tech revolution, which is uh, EHRs. Um, um, Thought-provoking question or comment, uh, any of the panelists would like to address that? For it, Zibu. <laughs> yeah, I could take a stab. Uh, it's definitely something we think a lot about, right? So we would not be successful as a startup as with the products that we sell if we if we were not uh, satisfying clinicians' needs, right? We sell directly to clinicians, and I think it's absolutely critical, as any good consumer company would do, to do good usability studies with the clinicians to get their inputs on what they want to see as well uh, as we are building out this product. So you would, you probably saw during my talk, I stress a lot about workflow and uh, ease of use and making it completely seamless. 
we think a lot about these things. We, we, we're not making the AI as one part of it, but thinking about the software and how it fits into the clinician's workflow, how you can make it visible with the least number of clicks, all of these things which are absolutely critical. And we spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I hope we're doing it right. And to be very honest, the, com the companies which are successful in the space will not necessarily be the ones which have the best AI, but will be the ones which have the best AI and the best workflow, and which have the best AI and the best usability, right? So I think that's going to be just as important as the area under the curve of your algorithm, right? And so we spend a lot of time thinking about both, and I think any anybody in the space should. I'll hand off to Bakul. Iran, you ask a really intriguing question, probably a very deep question as well. So I think you're talking about more than one dimension here. I think you're talking about participating in what Zugu just talked about in the development of the products. Number two, I think you're talking about an education and awareness of what's going on in this space so they can be ready for when the products come up because not everybody is going to hang up their white coats or even have their white coats to, participate, to partner with Zugu like folks. And three, I think you're talking about, um, you know, engagement and sort of transparency. So I'm going to touch up on all three of them. So first one, I think uh, Subu addressed it really well. People who have the opportunity to work with uh, developers, they should, um, which means that it could be participating through a clinical trials or some sort of study that's going on. So be part of that, engage with that. I think that's how you're going to get hands-on experience in my mind is a really good adult learning tool that, that can sort of get to a place where we can sort of not sit in a classroom and sort of teach. Number two, I've been talking to AMA about how do you engage physicians and physicians and use of AI at point of care is actually uh, a, a work stream under the collaborative community that we, we are partnering with at Xavier. I think people should think and look at that. I, I, can, I know people are very busy so may not be able to participate in what's going on, but it's actually a place where you can see what is happening. So AMA is really interested. Engage in your specialty within your AMA. I think they are also people like, uh, pe people who are really heavily oriented towards informatics, like ACR, like College of Radiology and other areas might be really easy to sort of get knowledge from, but other specialties may not necessarily be, right? So that's where you need to, I think there's needs to be like an uptick. Third and not the least, I think I think about education from a medical education perspective. Uh, and that's another topic uh, that I've started to talk about with medical, with AMA to see what can be done to train upcoming clinicians with, with this use of this technology. Because when you, when you then, then you can get to a place where we're not having clinicians uh, trying to shun a technology or not understand what this use. The last and the very small piece of the puzzle, and that may be something that we can, we can work, people who are engaged with the medical device or sort of the technology or the drug or product community can really start giving input towards what is useful for a healthcare professional at the point of use in transparency of the war product's performance. So, when Subu talks about area under the curve, how does it really translate to the actual use for their actual patient uh, when they're when they're encounter when they're using them in the encounter? So, so it's a multifaceted problem, but I think we have an opportunity. We, we cannot be like EHRs, where EHR happened and then everybody had to go there. I think we are. This is happening, and we need to get there with the with with the products as well. So I would just stop there. But I think it's a really important question that you just raised. I, I, I couldn't agree more and uh, very much in agreement with uh, everything that's said. So just to recap, right? Um, it, it's unfortunate, you know, we always <laughs> point to the HR experience, but in fact, it is true, right? Whomever, uh, and it could be a, a, uh, a variety of uh, different types of end users. So uh, involving them very early on in the design process and making sure um, the burden of use uh, and uh, the benefit they derive from it, right? Uh, the, the math makes sense um, and that it would actually uh, bring value and instead of being perceived as a burden. I mean, just so intuitive, but uh, it's, 
uh, in, in a world where we're so stressed, you know, whether it's aggressive timelines or, or limited budget, uh, sometimes some of these uh, early but absolutely necessary uh, steps are frequently um, overlooked or not overlooked, but, but um, you know, forsaken um, for, for all these reasons that's already talked about. And I, I love what you mentioned about working with AMA. It just makes me think about, uh, say, the, the genomics uh, revolution, right? So once you have uh, new technology, um, new ways of doing things, it, it, it is as much as most HCPs out there, and I know there's, uh, you know, a decade, every decade you have to go and take your research. So there are mechanisms in place to make sure everybody's still like on top of their game. But despite that, when I, when there's a, uh, a really revolutionary or, or something really impactful that that's introduced to, to their practice and people just don't feel quite ready. I'll give you an example in, in the emergency department when we started using ultrasounds, it's very clear <laughs> what generation you were trained. You either grew up with it or you did not. Uh, so it just creates this uh, uh, interesting uh, way of uh, you know how, how the, the clinicians have to uh, manage and and um, and and uh, do do what they can and back to genomics, right? Then all of a sudden, if you have most of the the practitioners out there who cannot uh, or not properly, or they don't feel confident they could interpret uh, the genetic test that's coming out, then all of a sudden there's this demand for a genetic counselor. So so who? what workforce needs to be created to, to fill that, that void, right? So it's very interesting. So in technology, um, I, I'm, I, you know, I do think about that. So we either, as Nicole said, you know, just get to the, the youngins and then get them trained so they're ready for, for uh, the, the new way of uh, practicing medicine and, and somehow uh, get the rest of the group um, caught up. So at least uh, they're, they're able to, to function and, and, and still uh, serve our patients. So really uh, interesting stuff. All right. Um, um, Yvonne, may I just interject a quick uh, second? I was thinking about you when you were talking because I recalled, it's not just necessarily like the younger generation is, you think about it uh, within the workforce, you have four different generations that are embedded and every generation brings their own different nuances. But I was uh, thinking about a device that we were moving through the regulatory pathway and tip, as with anything, we get what's in paper. So everything is written down and we're trying to synthesize this material to see whether or not it is safe or effective? Does it have all the questions that we need answered? And I remember we were struggling with this one particular device and you know they brought it to me and I said, hey, is there any way we could get a show and tell? Um, so one of the things that we had, we had the company come in and they had uh, providers that came with them as well and our providers and our engineers and everything and they got into a room for two hours and really started working through the technology and understanding how does this virtual reality device translate to uh, uh, practice of medicine and how do we have bailout scenarios for those individuals that may not be able to use the device so you know, one of the things that I, I thought about that we were since able to move that through to a positive, um, a positive uh, action simply by that particular usability um, for the uh, for the FDAers and our, our our full discipline there, as well as being able to ask those candid questions of the users that are using this and thinking about adoption and all of those different facets that are going to be needed. And that was a way for us to not just have the usability studies that you see come in the submission, but that was a way for us to um, really feel comfortable with the benefit and risk profile of the device and being able to add different aspects to the labeling that was not, not necessarily there based on that hands-on experience. So I say all this to say that it's equally important 
um, when we're doing anything that's come into FDA, you are going to need a usability uh, study for these tests. But I think, um, you know, when I say uh, come to FDA early and often, I think this is also a good um, avenue that those um, portability areas that can, uh, technology that can come, um, it will be helpful for the reviewers to be able to use it and ask those clear questions that you, that you have um, when you're reading the submission that comes to us. You, I have to run, unfortunately. Sure. But I'm jumping on another call. So thank you so much. And I really appreciate sort of the discussion. It's been super, super helpful. And I'm, I'm so sad that I have to leave right now. Vakul, you, I, thank you. We, you know, we, we really were all looking forward to, to hearing your presentation and uh, your, your engagement, your leadership. Oh my gosh, over the last, is it two decades <laughs> in the <Yeah>. space of call? <laughs> Is <laughs> a close to, but uh, so as as a uh, community, we we thank you, and uh, you know the fact that you were able to spend an hour and a half with us is greatly appreciated, and we'll reach out. We know where you are. We, we have your <laughs> email yourself. address. <laughs> but uh, all kidding aside, thank you very much, Bacol. Take thank care, you. guys. Great thank discussion. You. All right, great. I think we have seven minutes. Um, our our uh, organizer asked us to uh, end the session with uh, one, one topic, which is opportunities for ongoing engagement and collaboration. Um, any thoughts about, uh, I think this was another theme, right? Uh, to be successful in this uh, space, it's, it's really daunting how much, um, really you have to pull together uh, to, to make this work. And, and, you know, as I think about it, no wonder it, it's uh, really hard for uh, organizations, whatever uh, shape and form it looks like uh, to be successful in this. So um, how, how can we collaborate? How do we continue these conversations? So at the end of these, you know, few hours together, it doesn't just become, you know, a distant memory. Um, any any thoughts um, about uh, continued um, outreach, dialogue, collaboration? How do you guys do it? Any uh, any thoughts out there? I'll, I'll mute everybody so nobody. Okay, everybody's unmuted. <laughs> I think. So please please do uh, chime in. I can start us off. Uh, so one one thing that always astounds me is this sheer variety and breadth of digital technologies which are cleared by the FDA. And I often don't know about the things that get cleared. Uh, every, every time I hear about something new and it's super exciting, um, it would be fantastic if there were a venue where we could go and learn about the digital technologies which get cleared. Uh, other than me trolling through the FDA's, uh, you know, list of fight and get clearances, which is not that easy to do. So it, 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 this is just a open request is if, if there were a venue where uh, interesting technologies in the space, SAMDs, um, AIs that get cleared um, could be collated. Uh, I think a lot of us in this industry would benefit from um, learning about them. That is such a, this is Rohini Patel. That is such a fantastic thought, Subhu. That's exactly what I was about to say, considering, um, you know, when you first start off working on such projects, you have no idea where to look and looking for fight in case, looking for pro codes, it's so easy to go through and find what you're looking for. But for software related aspects, you read the fight in case, the summary, and you maybe might get some hints to what that um, manufacturer may have submitted. I know with the multiple uh, device guidance come out, the request is that individuals should state something about it. And then the fight in case summary would sort of hint that there, there is some component that has not been discussed, but to give a hint, but that's just a hint. I feel like that is still going to be so difficult to figure out how do you even go about understanding where should your device fall? And I think this is particularly for the ones where you are on the borderline, like you mentioned wellness, but there are borderline medical apps, mobile apps, where we don't know if we fall in the SAMD realm. 
and those are the difficult ones i absolutely am uh, planning on sending an email to digital health uh, the email that you have shared and again it's it's one of those things where we are not ready to go to that pre sub yet but we are in that early stages where we want to understand how should we even go about asking these questions other than going to a consultant and trying to you know go that route thank you rohini um thank you rohini i had a question cuz i i hear this um from a lot of innovators um in the sense that they're not yet ready to come in with a QSA. It would be interesting to understand because there's no timeline to say when to come in with a QSA. Uh, you can come in very early in your stage to be able to get the, the, the questions answered. And even if it's one question answer, we can go ahead and answer that question. It doesn't necessitate um, perhaps having a meeting or any of those different things, but just being able to answer your question. So I just want to know where that um, viewpoint is coming from regarding just answering some questions. I think it's more of we are in those early stages where we are trying to decide what design users, you know, what would those requirements be. We haven't fleshed out all the risks. We are still in that early stages of trying to understand if we are in that device realm or just. Wow non device medical uh, mddes realm so just trying to wish between those things like i said we will absolutely go forward with a pre sub if we feel that that's the route but like i said if there was a way that i could other than reading the guidance documents have a list of what is clear so i can gauge looking at those examples where i stand right. fantastic because ideally the examples that fda guidance suggests are those black and white we are always in that gray <laughs> Right, right. No, I think, uh, you know, send in to the email address that uh, Bakul has mentioned also gives a ready response. Um, and he does collaborate with the various review offices on his response. So it is consistent with what we're doing in those offices. Um, secondly, I do believe that each office also has a generic email account that um, can be sent emails on those questions that you feel are not and uh, ne um, needed to be included in a pre-submission, but I don't necessarily want um, the viewpoint to be that you can't submit a um, pre-submission. A pre-submission doesn't have to be something that's 800 pages with five questions or what have you. It can be a very small, high-level update and um, with just a question and it would suffice as well. Just just wanted to give you some of the things that we're thinking about from the other side of the house. But either way, I think I'm um, just asking those questions because you are absolutely correct. The guidance, we're trying to be very engaging as much as possible, but then it's based on what we know and then it's black and white knowing that there's gonna be case by case and nuances that we're not aware of. So yes, just ask your questions and we'll be able to guide you thoroughly. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know we're at time. I feel really bad. There was one question that th came through the chat. Maybe I could just quickly say it and then we'll wrap in one minute. Um, the question is, when a developer works through uh, thousands of data points and finds a correlation, for example, EKG predictive of uh, ejection fraction through application of an algorithm, does FDA require that, that the algorithm have some sort of physiological basis for the correlation? In other words, if the correlation seems arbitrary, would it be accepted? So that was the question. I don't know if that's a quick answer or we're out of time. I can give a super quick answer that many of the newer Machine learning techniques, especially the deep learning techniques, make it very difficult to know whether they're what the physiological basis is. Yeah. So it's not like I can look at the signal and tell you that there's an S elevation and therefore it is predictive of X. Um, so explainability of these machine learning algorithms has decreased over time. And what that puts is a higher burden on us to make sure that this algorithm works across different demographics and age and gender and so on and so forth. But my understanding is that the agency is willing to accept algorithms which show good safety and eff eff uh, efficacy without the requirement that they be um, explainable. 
Ah, okay. That's a, uh, yeah, again, very top of mind for a lot of people, right? Working in uh, AI, the black box, uh, what to do. All right. Thanks everybody so much. Uh, please uh, do join in three minutes. Uh, back to the main uh, conference though, uh, the original link from this morning. Thank you so much. I'll see you soon.